So welcome to, to our little session today. So it's all about bioregioning. What is bioregioning? Although that is a very loaded question, as we will see. And how is it useful? And that will, we will kind of explain maybe how it's useful to us, which hopefully might be useful to, to, to some of you in terms of what is it? How can it be used? Is it going to be useful for me? And how? So our insights are all early career insights. Um, we're academics and practitioners, and I'm going to um, just chat about that shortly. So yeah, take all of this with a grain of we're we're all coming at this with pretty fresh eyes, just because we're all quite early in our careers in, in bioregioning and in general, um, which is really interesting because we get to talk to people who've been doing this kind of work or this sort of line of work for a long time and talking to them about their experiences. But obviously, we sometimes come at it from a completely different angle, maybe, and ask some questions that everybody else takes for granted. So I think that can be both, um, you know, a slight obstacle or actually an advantage. So who are we? Um, just to give you a brief introduction. Um, so with me are Ella and Johnny. Ella is a PhD student at the University of Sheffield in the UK, and she is basically doing her PhD research work on bioregioning and participatory methods and exploring how bioregioning can be used to, to um, further regional development. And she's really interested in alternative econ economies and social movements, and I'm sure she'll talk about that um, more herself in a little bit. And then we have Johnny, and Johnny is our practitioner. He's um, a freelance systems practitioner, so he comes in into all things um, systems thinking, and he's working on plenty of projects that look at systems transformation, that focus on different um, issues, but also different sectors and geographies. And one of the things that he's interested in is this, this bioregioning aspect. And myself, I'm Maria. And I'm doing my PhD at the Agricultural University in Iceland. And I'm uh, doing a very specific, I guess, type of work here. I'm looking into public participation in coastal and marine planning. And I have found that bioregion might be really helpful for my work, which is all about community engagement and having these conversations about the larger environment and what it means for the people and what it means for their um, development in their in their communities. So with that being said, we're all going to talk to you about our specific journeys into bioregioning and how we got there in a little bit. But first, I will give it over to Ella to just talk about what are bioregions? What are we even talking about? Thanks, Maria. And that's a very good introduction. And I know it's not easy to talk about um, other people's research. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is what actually is a bioregion, which, as Maria kind of hinted, is actually not the most straightforward question. Um, so as a group, we've really been diving into what, what is a bioregion, so we're going to produce a whole big piece of writing about it. So what I'll give you is a very quick summary of what we think so far, really. Um, so as Maria suggested, all of our work in some way relates to this idea of a bioregion. And um, this thematic network is about bioregioning as a verb and bioregional planning. So for us, the kind of logical place to start is thinking about what a bioregion actually is. Um, and what I'll do now is I'll just share this, this quote by Peter Berg, who is one of the kind of foundational thinkers in bioregioning, because I think it sums up quite nicely what a bioregion is. So it says, Bioregions are geographic areas having common characteristics of soil, watersheds, climates, and native plants and animals that exist within a whole planetary biosphere as unique and intrinsic contributive parts. Um, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but basically what that's saying is bioregions are naturally defined areas. So rather than taking kind of human um, geography, so kind of like states or nations, or regions or councils in the UK. It's about saying there are, there are areas that do kind of exist in nature that have a kind of shared characteristic. So a lot of the time people use watersheds or catchment areas as a way to define a bioregion, but that might change on depending where you're from. So it could be that you're taking an area with a particular geology 
that kind of shapes shapes that landscape or a particular climate or there's a particular nutrient cycle or a keystone species which really is kind of characteristic of that area so the whole idea is saying that um, we've got human areas and we've got kind of naturally defined areas and they're not necessarily the same thing the way that we draw a map doesn't necessarily reflect what we might see when we just look out of our windows and the reason that we use this way of thinking kind of links to um, the bioregion as a kind of useful scale. So um, this quote is saying that a bioregion is kind of the, the area we should look at for thinking about living regeneratively. And the reason for that is saying that the way that we live, because we don't take into account these natural kind of units, um, we don't know how to live regeneratively anymore. So we don't know the systems um, we don't know kind of how to restore ecosystems or what those ecosystems should even look like. But actually coming back to this idea of a bioregion helps us get that knowledge back, helps us kind of fall in love with where we live again and want to take care of it. But it's also a kind of pragmatic scale at which we can actually kind of make a difference as well. It's a really useful scale. And that if we want to live sustainably, actually what this way of thinking is saying is that means we have to live bioregionally. So we have to live within those natural systems and um, yeah, learn to kind of regenerate them. So this is a really kind of short summary of what is a very complicated idea with lots of different ways of approaching it. But for us, these are the kind of useful things we want to pull out. So the first thing is that it's about naturally defined units. So it's following the kind of natural boundaries which have common characteristics that create whole systems and that's the foundation of what a bioregion is. The second is it's about working on a scale that makes sense so focusing your your kind of sustainability or your um, kind of regenerative work around a scale which is small enough that it's actually going to make a difference and that it can account for all of those systems together but it's not so big that you don't know where to start or you lose control of it. So it's a really useful scale, which is a kind of in-between scale. And the last one is, is really related. It's about systems thinking. So thinking about bioregions isn't just thinking about one part of where you're living. So it might be really useful if you're thinking about flooding to think about a bioregion, but you're not just thinking about water and that. You're thinking about how different species might interact to impact flooding or how different human systems and where people are living might impact flooding. So it's really about thinking together as a whole system. So these are kind of three things that we think um, are really central to bioregional thoughts. So I think it's, is it Johnny jumping in now? Yeah, sure. So um, thank you very much, Ella and Maria um for leading us into this so we thought it'd be useful to give you an idea of how we as individuals came into bioregioning um because there's we came into things in various different routes so it might be useful for you to hear you know what we first thought about bioregions and how that we and how we've been, been building on that um as we've come in so if i kick things off um i'm johnny from the uk and um, so i'm in a in a region called derbyshire so not too far from ella actually and I work freelance along various organizations um, using sort of systems thinking and transformative approaches. So um, using methodologies such as systems mapping, um, futures thinking, theories of change, um, infrastructure to, to try and understand systems better and how, how we can understand um, transforming to a, a future more regenerative state. And a lot of my work is with a group called Bounce Beyond. And we, look, we work with uh, industries and sectors on transformation. But what I found uh, most useful for me was the, the regional transformation um, and really sort of coming from a, a geographical perspective. And I've got a environmental background. I studied a master's in environmental leadership and management. So my value set, I guess, was in natural systems. And I just found it so much easier to understand the dynamics of a system when we're talking about a ge geography or a region um, and I found it much easier to apply the methodology methodologies to a region and so that led me to to really start looking into okay like if we're talking about regional change what approaches are really useful in this 
and I started talking to a few people and then eventually um, got put in touch with Glenn Page, who's in this, this webinar. Um, and Glenn, I had a chat with Glenn about sort of, you know, what we can use and, and we came to bioregioning um, as an approach. And I, alongside Maria and Ella, participated in a workshop that Glenn runs um, framed around bioregioning. And, you, and we went through this quite intensive process looking into a specific bioregion. And I was on a team with Maria looking into a bioregion in Iceland, in the West Fjords, um, and was just completely blown away with the approach of being able to come into a system that I previously didn't have any understanding of, uh, different to Maria, because Maria is, is based in Iceland, but to start to understand those dynamics firsthand and starting from that point of a natural system, but then being able to build on that with the social dynamics, the economic dynamics, and so on. So really painting this really interesting picture in your head of how to transform systems from a regional perspective. Um, and I found that really powerful. And it's something that as well is, is scalable and you can take it from region to region and implement similar approaches on. So I guess that's a, a bit of a story of my route into bioregioning. Uh, we're all happy to answer any, any questions after this session. So I will pass on to Ella. I'll pass back to you to, to explain your journey. Thanks, Johnny. So, um, like Johnny said, we live kind of 45 minutes away from each other. So um, it's funny that we're kind of actually almost within the same bioregion. Um, and we've had slightly kind of similar journeys, but quite different as well. So, um, so my undergraduate was also in geography. So I'm a um, kind of human geographer by trade. And what I came to my PhD really interested in is kind of post-capitalism and how do we get from a current system the current economic system to something completely different, which is more just and more sustainable. And what I was really interested in in particular was community led projects and the people that are already kind of creating alternatives. So how do we go from these kind of small scale projects to actually transforming a whole system through these people that are already trying to do that? Um, and I came across bioregional thinking sort of accidentally. I am. Um, I was looking for projects that were doing this kind of work that were kind of working towards um, changing the economy, but also thinking about the environment and thinking about people and how we can live better, really. And I came across a group in Scotland, which is called Bioregioning Tayside. And I was really interested just from looking at their website in the way that they were thinking and that they were coming from this very particular philosophy, which I'd never heard of, but just made a lot of sense to me, which was about starting with the place that you're in and not just thinking about the economy as one thing and the environment as something else and people and community as something else over here it was actually looking at how all of these things work together so I got talking to them and I learned a huge amount about Scotland and um, which I didn't know so um, Scotland has kind of one of the most concentrated land ownership in the world meaning that there's a very few people who own a lot of the land. Um, and it's also a very altered landscape. So what, what I would imagine when I'm thinking of Scotland is kind of big open land and big open estates. Um, but really that's a very degraded landscape. That's actually not what Scotland should look like. And I also learned about the history of Scotland and um, clearances where people were moved off the land to create those big estates. Um, and the challenges that now come with trying to kind of approach regional development and um, regenerative practices in that kind of system is really tricky. And so I was really fascinated that this way of thinking um, was what this group had chosen to kind of start doing this work. And it just felt really logical to me. It was about, you know, it was really rooted in place and thinking about how we can make this place thrive. And that's not just the human part, that's the non-human part as well. Um, so yeah, this kind of conceptually was really interested to me, interesting to me. And it, it came back to those questions which I had about the economy and living well, but it was reframing the economy to say, actually, what is this whole place like? Um, and it was just a really practical way of thinking as well. It wasn't about saying, let's go and live in eco communities and let's be totally self-sufficient. And that's the answer. It, it was really taking the system that was already there, understanding how we got to this place and thinking how we could reshape it in the future. Um, so it was really practical and it just made a lot of sense and resonated with me. Um, 
so that's really kind of how I came to dedicating four years of my life to really understanding this way of thinking and where it could take us and um, yeah so Maria I'll hand over to you yeah thank you so um got yeah my background is actually in in teaching and I was teaching in Scotland when I realized I wanted to do something to do with environmental education and one thing led to another and that led me into doing a master's in marine and coastal management still with the idea of environmental education so I did my master's in Iceland in the West Fjords so that was the kind of that first connection which is really funny that this is becoming a theme of the the Iceland Scotland connection um and uh um I came back from a PhD, which is to do with marine planning, but I'm more interested in the, yeah, the community engagement and how to sort of bring especially remote coastal communities into a point where there is agency and where there is stewardship of the environment. And I'm focusing on the, on the coastal and marine. And I mainly work in a project that's called Coast, and that is all about that, all about sustainable development goals in remote coastal communities across different case studies in different countries. So we partner with Finland and Ireland and Northern Ireland, and I am basically working on the case study in the West Fjords and Iceland. And through this project, I got to know Holly, and Holly, I think, introduced me to Glenn, and the rest is, is history. He, um, he uh, invited me to one of his bioregional workshop final presentation days and I saw what other bioregional groups had been doing um, and I didn't really fully understand what was going on to be honest but I was intrigued <laughs> and we had this idea of basically doing almost like a thought experiment on the West Fjords of Iceland is this a possible philosophy or school of thought that could be applicable to the West Fjords of Iceland because here there is no bioregional group that exists and there's no agency or anybody that is doing you know work on transformative change so it's kind of just just us uh, trying to start this this process and um so yeah we we kind of made up and, and founded this this bioregional group team that was thinking about the the west spirits of iceland and we were so lucky with with glenn to pull together sort of almost a a pilot learning journey in, into this landscape with with some of the people involved and that has massively helped for us to understand the bioregion but also given us opportunity to speak to people and to kind of bring forth this idea here this is what we're working on um does that at all resonate and i, I think the answer was yes and they led us on to to other issues that we hadn't been thinking about so i think for iceland it's very very much in its infancy as an idea but it has sparked a lot of discussion which is one of the things that I really like so much about this entire field of work and this entire way of of thinking um yeah and I'll leave it at that at the at the moment fantastic um so hopefully that's given you all an idea of how we um as three individuals have come into bioregioning in very different ways um and maybe it sparked up some thoughts in your own heads of of how you might be able to get involved or about how you might be able to use bioregioning. Um, so to, to follow on with that, we thought it would be fun to do um, a bit of an interactive exercise. And this is an exercise that was introduced to us through Glenn um, when we did the, the modules that, that he led. And it's an exercise that really gets you to think about, okay, there's these fantastic um, bioregions that we can learn from around the world. Um, like the one that ones that Ella and Maria have been talking about, but what's happening in my immediate bioregion? What's happening in my immediate surrounding? Um, and starting starting to think of those those dynamics that might exist and those issues that you might be able to sort of weave together in, in one system. So, hopefully, you've all got a paper and pen, or some form of um, technology that may be the equivalent. Um, because we're going to, as I said, go through a process that we're going to start thinking about exploring our local bioregion. So Ella, if you could go on to the next next slide. So we got, we're actually going to draw our bioregion. And so if, you, if you've got a paper and pen, what, what we could start doing, and I've seen there's a few people in here from Scotland, a few in the US, and, and 
and a fart, which is fantastic, is to just draw, first of all, where home is. And that may be a city, it may be out in the sticks in the countryside, but where is home for you? Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, it may be, it may be your house, it may be your, you know, your local nature reserve or something, somewhere that you feel at home. Um, and we haven't really talked about this, Ella and Mira, about how we're going to run through this. But I think if we just give people some time, maybe for each point, and then we'll go on to the next stage and we can run through this together, it'll probably take about 10 minutes, I'd imagine. Um, so for starters, then if we if we go with drawing what what home is to us just for, for a minute or two. I'll just add that there's no need to feel too embarrassed of your artistic skills. Uh, we won't share these around unless people feel the need to, to show us on, a, on our cameras. Um, but this is just an exercise to get us thinking about our local bioregions. So if we've drawn our home then, the next step, as you can see on the screen, is to think about what are the, the, the sort of local water systems to you? Uh, what, where are the rivers? Or if you live by the coast, where is the coastline and what does that look like? And what about the topography? Where are the hills, um, if there are any? Any of the sort of natural features that you can draw around your home? What are the key characteristics to your bioregion? We've mentioned that they may be defined by a mountain range or a watershed. So what's relevant to you? And so we'll go on to point three. Where does your water come from? So the water maybe that you drink or that you water your plants in your garden with, where does that come from? Have you ever thought about that? And then an easy one once you, as you're going through this is, where does your waste go? So that whether that's waste water or your your composting or your recycling or your stuff that maybe goes to landfill, where does, where does that go? And then taking a, a slightly different turn, what about the species? What about the, the plant species, the, the birds, the mammals? What, what species are a characteristic of your region? You may think it's normal for these species to be around, but as, as we start to contrast bioregions, we'll notice that some are unique to your region. But what species are unique or special to, to you in your bioregion? Okay, and then, so moving on from, from the species, so maybe that natural system perspective, what historical events uh, and changes have shaped where you, where you live? So that could be um, the last ice age, maybe you live in a, in a glacial environment, um, or it could be a, you know, a human historical event, it could be a war, um, or it could be farming or things like this, the agricultural influence. How has that shaped where you live? Um, the Industrial Revolution, maybe. What, what changes uh, were brought when, when these things happened? And finally, then, finishing off um, this drawing of our bioregion. Obviously, there's many other things that we could, could take into account. But what are some of the current issues um, that, you can, that you can draw? So whether it's an environmental issue or a social issue, what is it that you're trying to well, that maybe other people are trying to tackle in your region, or what are you trying to tackle? Maybe. And so if we start to finish up there, hopefully that's brought you through some sort of process that allows you to start to imagine where you live in a systemic way. So starting with, with the natural system and, and, the, and the topography and thinking about how you're framing your bioregion, but then what are the key dynamics within this? And then you can start to imagine, OK, with with these dynamics, how can I you know, weave these together and what can I piece together to allow me to maybe start some projects or start some initiatives or bring the right people together to have a conversation? And so if you're brave enough, um, maybe you could 
share your your drawing on your camera no problem if not but hopefully that's been a useful process to to allow you to Im imagine what bioregioning may exist like fantastic ella could you stop sharing so we can see uh see everyone's drawings wow that is fantastic we've got some resident artists excellent so i hope you enjoyed that that was just something slightly different to do in a zoom call um and with that i will pass on to maria to take yeah, us I was, just, I was just wondering um in terms of the the drawings if anybody found anything surprising in their mm. bioregion because when i did it last and when i did it now as you said i had a you know a slightly different take on it i was like when i did it last i was like right okay here are the mountains and so on and so on but now i i kind of you know added some other things is there anything that somebody has come across that they were like oh yeah i hadn't really thought about this in my you know day-to-day -day life but um now being prompted has anybody found something surprising as an issue or a species or anything like that So Maria, the I found that, um, and I don't know, I, I drive past this area of, of coastline every day on my way home. And it just struck me as I was drawing out my really sad drawing of, of mainland Cape Elizabeth here in Maine, that uh, the access to the water is completely blocked by large, uh, very expensive coastal cottages um, that you know really reduce access to the waterfront. Uh, for anyone for recreation or things like that. Um, and so that was really interesting. I hadn't really thought of it that way. I've seen these, I've seen this day in, day out, but for for some reason today, it just struck me that lack of access um, to a beautiful waterfront. Which is a huge topic in it, in itself, isn't it? Yeah, I have, I mean, mine's pretty full, but I was looking at species and I, I added the eider duck, which is really important to Iceland culturally as well as economically. And then I realized, oh, but because of the eiders, you have to add the Arctic fox because they shoot the fox, so the fox don't eat the eiders, and they take the eider down and make a lot of money of it. But the the story in Iceland is the eider duck is to be protected, and the Arctic fox is a pest. So it's a very it it, it shapes governance really. It shapes laws on what you know what's protected and what's not. So I, I thought that was interesting, and probably I did this now because now it's a different season. And you see eider ducks nesting everywhere along the coastline, which I probably didn't see when we did this last, when it was uh, late summer. So, yeah. And a great it's comment, a, a great comment um, from Dr. Uh, Priscilla Arana from Mauritius. She said she's not a drawer, but even listing answers to the questions made it harder to think of identifiable boundaries because the geographic space I call home is an oceanic island. And that's a conversation that's come up in some of our interviews as well, where we're saying actually an island seems like the perfect bioregion because you can say this is where it starts and this is where it ends. Um, but then we also had conversations about whole chains of islands and are they a single bioregion or are they multiple bioregions? Um, so it's not it's not always as simple as it seems like it should be to draw those boundaries. Um, and I think Stuart had his hand up a moment ago as well. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe. Uh, a point, an observation and a question, if I could. Uh, I'm currently involved in a project um, looking for inscription uh, from UNESCO for a new world heritage site called the Flow Country of Caithness and Sutherland, and it's perhaps the world's largest uh, blanket bog. But what I had to reflect on here was the whole issue of boundaries, of watersheds, of catchments, of organisation is fundamental to that process as well. We're having to define an area, but how do we define that area? What do we define it on? It's an, it's a, it'll be proposed on a natural capital basis, so we can't define it on uh, political or geopolitical or administrative boundaries, and we've had to go down the the watershed catchment type route, but even that opens up a whole range of other questions as well. So it was quite interesting that, that the process you've just taken us through here 
is almost the thinking that we've been going through and thinking about this this world heritage site and that's involved people from uh, business backgrounds from planners councils conservation groups a, a wide range so that was just just the observation the question for you and at least two of you perhaps all three of you used the word uh, remote in in your uh, in your introductions and i'm just wondering whether in the context of thinking about bioregions whether we need to find a better word and whether this is really the, the right word to be using i understand it's colloquial use and in those terms we're probably thinking a bit remote from urban centers from population centers but by regioning it, it it seems to be more about a, a place based approach and if that place is defined in terms of water or natural capital then that is the center and the term remote becomes a, a subjective term and if you're living in the city i could chat I'll, you know you could turn it around and say if you're living in the city you're remote you're remote from the natural capital you're remote from your food sources you're remote from your water sources so i'm i'm wondering if there's a better term than remote or do we always have to define it as remote from something i just think this is a place-based approach it becomes quite powerful in places that ownership back into the sort of areas that are probably disenfranchised and have been disenfranchised over time when uh, resources and decision making has been drawn into cities. I think that's a really great point, Stuart. And I don't know if Maria wants to jump in from thinking about Iceland, but I think I would. My response would be yes, but <laughs> we should have a different word, and I don't know what that word should be. But I think you're right that the kind of, for me, the power of bioregionalism is recentering those questions of whatever it is that defines that place and what we found through working with colleagues in different places is that um the way people understand that is quite different um we've got a colleague in australia and when we're talking about um kind of landscapes to how you draw those boundaries and what the center is and whether we're centering humans or non-humans um those conversations are completely different in an australian context so what can be quite useful is saying this is a place-based way of seeing and the way that you apply it is different depending on where you are. Um, that then gets quite difficult to give one label to. But I don't know if Maria wants to jump in from her work in Iceland. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess two things. Um, yes, I uh, may have actually, <laughs> because I was just, you know, free rolling this. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really equate remoteness and bioregioning at all together, especially with the Clyde side and, and Tay side bioregioning and, and what I've learned from that. I don't really see them in the same category or necessarily. Um, my my sort of main project and maybe that's where sort of my my chat was coming from is mainly working with remote coastal communities but even then we've already had this conversation in 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 one of our other meetings where we're like yeah remote from what um do they actually feel remote um and and so on so i think it's a it's a really interesting observation i don't think bioregions or bioregioning has to be has to do with anything that that is remote from cities in fact we have actually talked about cities um the other day and can cities be a, can a city be bioregion and, and how does that work can you live bioregionally if that's a thing in in a city um so yeah definitely yeah um, I, I think i would just add in as well like the the thing that i found really interesting about bioregions is it's you can create it to be whatever you want it to be within context of what you're trying to achieve um, within using bioregioning. So even going down to the language, the language that you use can be completely specific to whatever you're crafting up. So if it's around marine issues or if it's within a city, use whatever you want to use. It's just, it's just a term that's there to say we're working within these boundaries. And I think what you're saying about being um, cities being remote in a completely different way to what we usually talk about is a really fantastic fan fascinating concept really and i'd love to look into you know cities as bioregions and how we can start to increase interactions with nature even in a, a huge mega city for example um 
So yeah, that's a really interesting point. Thank you. So uh, my colleague, Jack Dibb from UNH has raised his hand. So Jack, you had a question. Well, I just had a comment. And I guess one thing when I was thinking about, you know, the challenges that are facing my region, it, it makes me wonder if you sometimes run into a problem if you focus too much on bioregioning. So, you know, I live in the woods. It's, you know, not old growth forest, but have a tree farm. I've been watching, you know, and the last few years, particularly, you know, not being in the office as much, the arrival of all the different birds and different wild plants and amphibians. And we have a ton of water, you know, probably 15 vernal pools and a small pond. And the things that I've noticed the past few years are all these pests threatening my trees, right? Emerald ash borer, woolly adelgid, about two years ago, or last year, some kind of weevil defoliated all of the oak trees, you know, and then, and then summer before that, it was so dry. Here in New England, the changing climate is not really indigenous. It's not a regional thing, but it's really a big challenge. And so I wonder if you draw your boundaries too small, whether the bioregioning concept can't address some really critical issues because of global connections. And the same is obviously true about politics and economics, but I was just thinking of really watching the, the local nature. Yeah, I think that's a, a brilliant question because I think, and, that, and that's one of the challenges of any kind of um, action, which is focusing more locally, however local or big or small that is. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of debate within the kind of literature on bioregionalism about what is a bioregion? Like, could you say that um, Tayside in Scotland or South Devon is a bioregion? Um, you know, other people have said like there are eight bioregions of the world and those are the scales of bioregions we should be looking at. Um, and in Australia, there is a map which has been produced, which says these are the bioregions. These are the lines around them. And that is a kind of top down map of bioregions. There's no debate within it. Um, so I think the, the question of how, how you choose that scale is really interesting. Um, and I think it, it, again, it's quite context specific in the UK, it kind of seems to be a lot more small scale that people say, I feel a difference when I move from this valley into the next one, the next valley doesn't feel like home. So I'm going to draw my boundary around that, um, which is a really useful scale for some questions, but for other questions, as things move across those boundaries, it's, it's not so useful. So th thinking about things like invasive species, actually maybe that the scale of a bioregion isn't, isn't that useful in all contexts or the way you draw the boundaries has to be slightly different. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's a really great question. And what I, what I find helpful thinking through bioregions as a way of thinking is it actually opens up those questions and those debates about what is what, what belongs in that bioregion and what doesn't. And it's actually a way of asking those questions. So at what point is something an invasive species or at what point is it we can say actually it's been around for long enough? And it, it allows you to have those conversations about what belongs and what doesn't. So that, that's how I find it useful. I don't know if um, Johnny or Maria have any other responses to that question. Yeah, I, I think um, that's a fantastic point. And thank you, Jack, as well. Um, it's, you know, we so often when we're talking about bioregioning, we go to the boundary to start off with, um, because that's that can be what excites people. It's like, oh, the mountain range or the watershed. But you can completely reverse that as well. It could be thinking about, Okay, so what is the issue? Is it invasive species or is it is it something else? And then mapping the key dynamics within that issue and then seeing, you know, if they're key people like decision makers, for example, or key species, what boundary did they then fall within once you've mapped it? So it doesn't have to start with the region. If you if you mapped, for example, a, a species um, coverage of a region and then find out that what you originally thought was going to be a bioregion turned out to be slightly too small or too big, then you can change it about. It's not something that is a framework that we're just sort of dumping from place to place. The beauty of it is that it's completely context specific and there's no right or wrong way really of, of approaching it. So we have a fantastic, another comment um, from Dr. Arana, which I think is really a powerful comment. In that same vein, I do wonder how the hosts have seen or know 
of the overlap, overlap or integration of issues like homelessness, migration, and prison systems within bioregioning? How do we make those boundaries mean something relevant to underprivileged communities and communities with the least power to influence decision making in those regions? So we're digging a little bit into governance, you guys, and, and voicing those who are on the, are traditionally on the margins. So I'm wondering how that those communities can play a role and be empowered through this uh, lens. I think that's a great question. And I, I might do the academic thing of saying that's a great question and answering by talking about something totally different. But I think one of the um, one of the, the kind of critiques that comes up a lot is like, again, about these questions of, of who belongs and, um, you know, this way of thinking kind of quite easily slip into you're not from this place, you're not indigenous, so you don't get a say. And at the same time, balancing um, issues of indigeneity and um, settler indigenous relationships as well. So there's always difficult balances around kind of questions of um, how to empower people who might be marginalized by these kinds of conversations. Um, and I'm wondering if Maria's got any insights from, I think you've just popped that in the chat, Maria, um, from working in Iceland. But I think, again, for me, it's about, um, it's, a way of, it's a way of thinking that can centre those conversations and can, can be a way of seeing all of these integrated systems, whether it's like housing, um, incarceration, alongside environmental systems. It can be a way of recentering voices. It can also be a very easy way of excluding those voices. So I think there's a tension there. But Maria, do you want to hop in? Yeah, just maybe with a tiny comment that I've been, yeah, talking, just talking to a different community that I'm usually in, in, in Iceland. So coming with, you know, not, not much context from that specific uh, community and basically talking about quintessentially like an environmental issue or issues relating to the marine environment. And within two minutes of the conversation, we're talking about um how the, the governance system is is not fair how there's corruption how um people tell me that they feel um yeah helpless to to have any effect on their marine decision making and that's that's like well established icelanders that's not even what you would traditionally call oh that they're at the margin of society and i i know that especially foreigners here have exactly that problem they are well integrated often in terms of their expertise and their field but in as soon as it gets into governance levels nobody wants to hear from them <laughs> uh, that's that's one sort of thing that i see happening around me all the time in in iceland and that sort of makes this the you know a very local conversation huge um maybe that's also very iceland specific because it's not that many people and a local fisherman's issues within three minutes of talking to that person, it, it, it will come down to the ministry or to the to parliament and, and what's going on there. So that's that's been really, really interesting to me. And that's uh, it's worth reflecting on that bioregional idea. And can we even talk about smaller, you know, smaller scales than just Iceland as a as a whole? Um, so that, that's been really interesting. Obviously, I have no solution to, to that. or I don't really have any innovative way of, hey, here's a way of, of tackling this. But I think I agree with Ella in terms of it's definitely a good way to start this conversation and to um, to sort of poke around in it, <laughs> poke the bear of, of all of these issues. Yeah, I think just to add as well, it's you could almost flip it and, and think of, OK, if I'm, you know, I'm very privileged and I'm, I'm and I'm not but if I was a homeless individual living in a place how could a bioregional approach help me um and you know just for the experiences that I've had with bioregioning it allows you to really get a sense of of that place and understand it so if we use bioregioning as a framework to aid a certain issue then you would you know in context of something like homelessness what would bioregioning do it would bring up those key initiatives maybe, or those key organizations that could start to weave together to form an infrastructure that can support, um, you know, a, a homeless project or something like that. Um, and it just allows you to start seeing that local system that could be used in service of a key issue. Um, I haven't heard of any of these, so it'd be really interesting again to look into that and develop these ideas further. 
Um, but I don't know why that shouldn't or couldn't be done. So some really great um, conversation happening in the chat, um, and we will uh, be hopefully passing on some of these resources to folks. If they're interested, if, if we have some resources to add, please feel free so that we can share some information. Um, I would love to impromptu um, ask Glenn Page um, if he would like to uh, address that last question, because I know a lot of the work that you do, Glenn, um, outside of this uh, North Atlantic space, but also here, right here in Maine, really does address this issue of pulling together all voices within a system, particularly those who are at the margins, so that we can truly see the bioregion, both its history, its present, and its potential future. Yeah, and um, shout out to Johnny, Ella, and Maria. Well done, guys. Really, really, really great presentation. Um, and I love the dialogue because just as you said, Johnny, the boundaries of bioregioning, the power of it is in its fuzziness and its context appropriateness. And the other sort of magic I've found at least is thinking about scale and the nested nature of thinking in terms of bioregionalism. So whatever boundary you're choosing and the process itself of choosing boundary is in some ways more powerful than the actual decision of what the boundary is. Who's deciding it? What's, what are you taking into account? And Stuart, I loved the um, framing that you were talking about the Cape Ness and the Sutherland um, area because it's it's those questions but it's that process of what it means and who's involved and that's where that perspectives point comes in and the marginalized voices and how bioregioning can address these um, issues as we know that the income uh, and sort of equality gap is increasing so significantly I was just down in a amazing bioregion of the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica, and it's astounding how many people are co coming in and buying their third or fourth home on the coast of the Osa in Costa Rica, and how many of the people who are working there, that's their third or fourth job. And so it's creating these huge inequalities. Uh, but the other piece is around interrelationships. And again, I think these questions of social well-being and, and what does it mean to have a um, more equitable society, just society, is around these interrelationships um, and how we engage with, our, um, with ourselves. The final thing I'll say is um, um, I've been listening to the um, amazing book by Brene Brown and called Atlas of the Heart, and it's all about emotion. And it's astounding how much of the emotional language that she unpacks in Atlas of the Heart, which is an extraordinary book, how much it's related to place and how much it's related to our understanding and engagement with place. And things like, um, she's emphasized this idea of unlearning. And I think one of the powers of bioregioning, if we are to use it in its both lightest and most powerful ways is in what are we unlearning that we've formerly held really strongly in our minds? How do we let go of what we've already sort of assumed to be true um, by re-inhabiting place? Um, so no answers, but questions. Thank you, Glenn. So um, we are gonna wrap this up. I know there's one more slide from our presenters. So um, hand it back to you guys. Thank you, Ella. Um, yeah, we just kind of wanted to, to, to wrap this up and to leave you with, although we're very aware of a lot of the barriers and, and, and sort of critiques and criticisms on, on bioregioning. In fact, that's part of why I think we're still with it and talking about it so much. Um, why we're still excited about or why we're excited about bioregional thinking and why we're kind of working with it or what makes it so intriguing to us. And I think part of it is that fuzziness that Glenn just referred to. And part of it is also this, this little bit of impossibility to have global issues, but you, the only scale you can even you know, act as a community might be locally or regionally, the kind of the the only manageable scale that you can 
kind of have action in um, that that makes sense for a whole system. Um, hopefully, it would be the the way that you know that it gives agency to two people in in places in in regions or in cities or in remote communities or where wherever they are. Um, it definitely starts the conversation of what would give us agency. What can we do to to better this, that, or the other? Um, obviously, it's a it's this idea of systems thinking. How it's all interrelated. It's probably not just one problem. It's probably not just this river is polluted, or there is one invasive species, or we don't have sewage treatment those kinds of things it's probably all sorts of things that are that are related to each other and a lot of these will be causes outside of of the bioregion of the bioregion um what personally draws me to it and back to it a lot is whenever i get into sort of different groups and conversations with different scholars and different peoples and practitioners about bioregioning they all have this 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 will and this aim to, to to reconnect with nature and to foster some sort of stewardship and i think that at the heart that is my personal favorite of all of those um that are listed here um and what what is really funny about bioregioning because you kind of at some point you do identify a scale when you come together as a group and you say okay this is tay side bioregion or it's the west Yards bioregion or whatever you kind of define it at some level but what's really cool about this is that then, you know, people like Glenn and Holly pull us together and you get to do all these at least thought exchanges with other bioregions and see, oh, what are they doing here? This is a really cool idea. Can we do this here? Or can we at least think about doing this here? Or can we scale it up or down? So this, although it's kind of focusing maybe on the local and maybe on the region, you end up having all this input from you know this global bigger network with all sorts of really intelligent creative individuals and groups that are doing amazing work so that's i think been a massive motivator as well to to stick with it and to explore it more and i think with that that's um, pretty much my my final thought and uh yeah well i don't know how we are in time pretty much i think we're we're pretty much at the end um yeah. so um I do want to thank our amazing presenters for being so inspiring. Um, and uh, on behalf of the UArctic Thematic Network for Bioregional Planning and Resilient uh, Rural Communities, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, we have a link to our web page for the uh, thematic network in the chat. I invite everyone to check it out if you are interested in joining us in this work through the UArctic. Uh, we're more than happy to have members uh, even if you are not members of the UArctic, you can certainly join our team. There's a resource page there for you of, of articles and videos, and also, um, you know, the opportunity to connect with all the member institutions that I mentioned earlier, Sustainometrics, University of Highlands and Islands, the Agricultural University of Iceland, and of course, UNE and UNE North. So again, thank you to all. Um, have a wonderful day wherever you are, um, and best wishes. Thanks. And thank you to Holly for bringing us together. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming and for taking part. Thanks, so. Thanks bye -bye. everyone. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Great work, guys. And thank you, Holly.